Okay, we are now live. You've come to the right place, everybody. Today, we'll be hearing from Grant Dory on leadership lessons from sport procurement, the ultimate team sport. So uh, stay tuned. We're just going to wait for a few more people to join. But as always on a SIPS webinar, we would like to know where you're all from today. So make sure that you go to the chat bar and take all attendees and all panelists and let us know where you're caught, where you're coming in from. Great to have you on board. Look, people have already started. Sunny and hot Brisbane. Fantastic to have you on board. It's much, it's not that hot down here in Melbourne. So you have definitely come to the right place for the SIPS webinar today. Do continue to tell us where you're all calling from. Leadership lessons from sport, procurement, the ultimate team sport. Looking forward to this session. Well, let's get started. So welcome and thanks for joining us for the session today and it's Leadership Lessons from Sport, Procurement, the Ultimate Team Sport and we'll be hearing from Grant Dory today. A warm welcome from myself. My name is Sharon Morris and I'm General Ma Manager of the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply for Australia and New Zealand. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung and Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians on the land on which I present from today here in Melbourne. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people today. And Tinakoko, 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 Katawa for our New Zealand friends. We're delighted to be able to connect with over 100 registered attendees today and that's people from all over the region as you can see from the chat bar and further afield. So please keep telling us where you're from and please keep communicating via the chat bar uh, throughout the, the, the session. As part of our commitment to the procurement community, SIPS is really delighted to be able to present these informative and really inspirational sessions and we see as the global professional body for procurement procurement and supply, um, we're here to support you, to support our members and to support the procurement community. We're really your professional partner for life. So we're in for a real treat today and I'm really looking forward to hearing from our inspiring speaker Grant, He's, um, who has been brought to you by the SIPS Queensland Branch Committee. But first, allow me to make a special mention of two more inspiring individuals. Uh, today's host, the Chair of the SIPS Branch Committee, Tivoli Sprague, um, MSIPS, and today's moderator, Ashley Turner, who's also a Queensland Committee member. And for those of you who don't know, Tiv and Ashley, like all members, members on the SIPS branch committees across the region are committed volunteers. They're SIPS volunteers and they serve with a wealth of experience. Um, they show true leadership and dedication and passion uh, to our profession. And really, SIPS couldn't do without our valuable volunteer committee. So really thanks to the contribution of the Queensland Committee today and all of our volunteers across the region. Now to our host, Tivoli. Much thanks and over to you. Thank you for that, Sharon. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Tivoli Sprague, and I join you from beautiful, sunny, hot uh, Brisbane today. So I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on leadership, which I believe is a really extremely um, important quality for procurement professionals, regardless of your position or title. One of my favourite quotes about leadership is, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, then you are a leader. The purpose of today's webinar is to transfer lessons from high performance sport and business to empower us as procurement leaders and procurement teams to be more self-aware, connected, cohesive, adaptable and resilient. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping notices. So I'd like to advise everyone that the webinar is 
currently being recorded and will be made available to all um, members um, on the call. Um, all attendees have been muted during the presentation. However, we do ask that you utilise the question and answer box, write any questions you have for Grant, and we look forward to answering as many of these as possible at the end of the session. You also have the chat button available, and many of you have already used that. And this is where you can make any general comments um, to share with the attendees. Now, a bit of information about our speaker today. So um, we're very grateful to have Grant Dory um, presenting for us. Grant is an Australian uh, uh, professional rugby union coach and former professional rugby league footballer. Grant started his career in Australia, appearing sporadically for Manly Warronga and Eastern Suburbs between 1990 and 1993. He is currently a high performance consultant and has extensive experience specifically managing high performance professionals in sport and business. He has the ability as a recognised expert in transferring lessons of leadership from elite high performance sport to business leaders and teams. He has valuable real life lessons with 25 plus years um, experience um, across the heat of the battle um, in elite teams. We really look forward to Grant's presentation and also lessons for all of us as procurement professionals. As um, Sharon mentioned, the question and answer session at the end will be moderated by Ashley Turner. And Ashley is on the SIPS committee with myself and was also the 2019 Young Procurement Professional of the Year. And she will be moderating the session at the end. Now, without further ado, over to you, Grant. Thanks, Tivoli. I'm just sharing my screen with you just to give me a... Uh, okay, great. Can we all see that? Is that reasonably clear for us all? Great, thank you. Thanks. Now, first of all, I'd just like to uh, thank everyone for taking up their time. I know that um, you know, people have been affected very, in very different ways by our our recent challenges and our recent crisis. So I, first of all, I hope everyone's well. I hope everyone's families are well. And I appreciate you giving up your time. And I really thank you for taking you know, this opportunity to, to continue your commitment to your own development. Um, I'll just start with, I'll, I'll just, I'd like to start with the why. Um, and just taking this back a, a few months, we, I started having some conversations with, with Tivoli and Dougal around four to five months ago. And there was a genuine curiosity um, from both of them in, in terms of exploring some soft skills leadership uh, development opportunities for the procurement space. So I initially, I initially, initially was uh, apprehensive because I, what I recognised straight away is I actually knew nothing about procurement. So Tivoli and Google through their networks uh, allowed me to, to connect with some people, um, join some dots, and really understand you know, some of the current reality challenges that, that's going on procurement right now. So what I intend to do today is just to, to share um, you know, in this webinar of procurement, the ultimate team sport, share seven key concepts, um, including best self, uh, developing and executing a plan, getting the basics right, high performing teams, getting the right people on the boat and getting a seat at the table. Grant, can so you just really, pop it in presenter mode? Just pop it in presenter mode. Thank you. Sure. Sorry about that. That was the, that was the second thing. I, that was my second task of the day that I, I needed to nail. Thank you. Um, so the, out, the outcomes of today, hopefully, are simply that you as procurement leaders and, and leaders of high-performing teams will take away potentially one thing that you may be able to imp implement with your teams that will enhance your contribution as a leader in your business. So I, I recognize really clearly that everyone comes from different environments, different industries um, with very unique challenges and you know, unique challenges exist for everyone in all, in all shapes and sizes. So what I hope for really is to, that you take on board a key message that we're here as leaders to help others succeed, you know, how we empower stakeholders around you and we build connections and we build an understanding and a genuine appreciation of the role of procurement and how it enables cross-functional success 
for teams is is a really critical part of the message um, and how it affects success and connection across the business. What I do at the moment is I, I coach leaders and that, that's from emerging leaders with very little experience to C-suite leaders. And really it's about having leaders being more connected, more collaborative and more committed to shared success in their business through uh, purpose-driven leadership and values-based leadership. Basically, it's about helping them bring the best out of their teams and bring the best out of themselves. Hopefully, what I, what I do is I help their teams win bigger and achieve more together. At the end of the day, it's about inspiring leaders to be the best they can be. You can see there clearly my, my purpose as a, as a leader is to inspire excellence through enhanced connection and I really utilize lots of messages from high performance sport to, to get those messages across. We'll move on. So the first concept we're going to explore today is about best self. And really best self is about reimagining your potential as a leader. And I love the, um, the consistent challenge that we have of linking our personal success to collective success. So how our, our shared success model fits in. So I'm a big believer that we control our own destiny um, and you decide as a, as a leader of what sort of leader you will be. What the, the, the most recent research tells us is that highly effective leadership um, is really based on who you are versus what you, are, what you do. So it's more about the type of person you are and the experiences you create for the people around you and you, you know, you being the best version of yourself possible in an authentic and in, with integrity as often as possible um, really determines who you are. So for me, it come back, comes back really simply to my clarity on my own identity and purpose, you know, my why and what I stand for and that the values and, and behaviors that are important to me that I can represent myself um, you know, with my teams, with my people, enhancing those connections, enhancing those interactions with every possible conversation or every conversation. What I recognize is having, having worked in many high performance sports environments and business environments, um, you know, I, I recognize that there's complexity everywhere. And like procurement, um, we've got complex multi-stakeholder environments um, you know, with lots of complicated or even at times difficult relationships to nurture as a leader. And I consistently challenge myself in relation to this best self concept to really nail my core roles and responsibilities as a leader. I look, at, I look really closely at how I'm enhancing the experience of, of those people around me and helping them succeed. And this has really become a really simple measure for me being my best self. And it's my contribution to collective success. My ability to do that consistently is really all about how I show up personally on any given day. And that's about my mindset, my attitude, uh, my positivity, and sometimes recognizing that I'm not in that in, in that space and I need to potentially just take some time and adjust my mindset and positivity to enhance those people around me. Um, so it's a consistent check-in with my self-awareness. I know that great leadership takes great energy and I know it takes a commitment to grow and develop over time. Um, and I really look at it in a really simple way that it's, it's not that I don't know things, it's that just that I have unlearned skills that I've got, I've got opportunities to learn, to grow my capability, potential and leadership influence over time. When I'm doing really well as a leader, I never um, take, my eye, take my eye off how I fit into the bigger picture. I'm always really closely um, connected to how I enable others to succeed around me and how I fit into the jigsaw. And really that's about enhancing people enhancing capability, enhancing teams, and having that team first attitude always that sits above my personal success. Fundamentally, it's about building trust. 
It's about building connections. It's about nailing the, the fundamental moments or tasks or conversations um, by authentically being present, being the best version of myself possible and delivering on my key roles and responsibilities for the group in relation to whatever they may be. The next concept we're going to explore is the, the concept of developing and executing a plan and having the courage to innovate and change. So what I've learned about success in sport and business over the last 20 years, you know, and I've been lucky enough to go to four rugby world cups and coach in over a hundred test matches for, for varied countries is that the best, the best team doesn't always win. Um, and what I've really learned is that mostly it's the team that wins is the team that adapts the quickest, that a team, a team that recognizes and maximizes the opportunities. It's a team that does the basics better, who, that works harder, is more connected as a team in relation to their, their purpose and their overarching why. Um, so how do you plan for that? I recognize in myself as a younger coach, I often had that, that top plan of, you know, looking very clear and, and easy. The point between start and finish was, was, was I had lots of clarity. What I recognized over time is the reality is very different. So in sport, we have very um, structured performance cycles. There's competition milestones, um, there's tournament uh, milestones, there's blocks of work that allow us or ensure that we, that we need a balance and a need for both short-term and long-term perspective when you're creating your approach to planning and getting that plan right. I know that success is closely linked to the clarity of the plan because I know that uh, really quality planning gives stakeholders a really clear idea about where they're heading and how they're gonna get there and their role in executing that plan. And I find that, that core clarity around planning and what that gives individuals is the, the greatest enabler of potential. So my thinking on planning has changed a lot over the years. I was one, uh, you know, as a younger coach, I was really methodical and having long-term plans. But what I've recognized now is that I'm much more focused and have a changed approach on the relentless pursuit of short-term goals. In my experience, what, or excuse me, what my experience tells me is that rigid long-term plans now more than ever are potentially a less relevant and effective. You know, change is the new normal. Adaption is the, is the new expectation. So I must create space and opportunities within any plan to innovate, to adapt, to adjust, to problem solve, to allow my people to problem solve and be um, solutions focused. I've got to be able to have a diversity of contributors to that planning, um, to that planning methodology. I've got to have a really balanced approach to how it fits in. And I've got to have checkpoints along the way and recognize what's working well and what potentially needs to change. So having the plan isn't the be and all end all for me. Having the courage to identify during the plan, recognizing, potentially trusting at times your gut instinct or trusting at times your, your enhanced decision-making process that, that allows you to see things earlier and identify quicker um, opportunities or threats it allows you to adjust and pivot a plan to maximize those key opportunities or adapt to key threats. So it's about having the courage to change. A few things I always consider in relation to planning is it does it, does this plan allow me to maximize our strengths? Does it take us outside our comfort zone? Does it stretch us? Does it show clear understanding of our game and how it looks or, or our key role and how, that, and how that looks for us? And does every player have genuine clarity on their role and also the skills that are required to implement that plan? And have I built enough connection and purpose in relation to the confidence that I need to build for those players to express themselves confidently while delivering that plan? So whether you're in procurement or whether you're in high performance sport, the complexity of the plan may change. But my key point in relation to planning is ensure you have the courage to change the plan along the way. Rigid planning has come 
has hurt me on many an occasion. The next concept we're gonna explore is getting the basics right. So what my fundamentals look like. And this may, be, this may be a bit of a surprise to you, but I'm not gonna talk about the mental, the physical, the tactical, the technical, or the so that in procurement that would be the technical capabilities that you need to excel as a leader. Because my big belief is that I know one thing, I know that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So it doesn't matter what my technical or tactical plan is for my players. I've got to be connected to what our shared consciousness is. I've got to be connected to the, or clearly have a clear link and direct association with my players and or my people, their deeper intrinsic motivations, their purpose that drives them. No, their why. For me as a leader, knowledge is power. And what I, these are some of the things I need to know. I need to know what our tension points are. I need to know how does it manifest itself for me and my team. I need to understand what individuals need from me as a leader to help them succeed. And I know that procurement with many complex, uh, uh, complex and complicated relationships, you spending time to enhance the individual journey is a key part of you being a successful leader in, and really enhancing your circle as in, of influence as a leader within the business. So for me, it's all about connection. It's about people, relationships, conversations. It's at the heart of everything I do. So my key message today really is this, that I'm not in the business of professional sport, I'm in the people business. And my role as a leader in the people business is to enable every individual to succeed. And I know that when I do that with the individuals, that will lead the team to success over time. So I've got to understand aspirations. I've got to understand what personal goals look like. I've got to make feel people connected, engaged, um, you know, psychological safety to share, um, you know, empowered, the opportunity to grow and learn. All of those things are critical to me building the connection of having a people first culture. What I recognize in modern teams is the me or the I has never been as important as it is right now. So you've got to learn to lead the individual to grow the capability of the team. You've got to learn to lead and coach the person. It's got to be, you know, with empathy and care at the heart of it, that their individual needs is critical for you to understand, to be able to get the best out of that person. So getting this people uh, piece right takes a lot of skill and energy. And every conversation is critical. Uh, my focus when I'm having those conversations, I'm a big believer in fast, frequent feedback and lots of unstructured conversation that builds connection over time. So it's always my challenge as a leader to explore that spectrum of leadership styles and leadership skills that I need at any particular time with any particular person. So I'm most comfortable in the autocratic and democratic space. So I, I recognize the time when I need to be autocratic and I recognize the time when I need to be democratic, but I'm also very consultative and transformative at the same time. So I ask lots of questions. I transfer, I trans, transfer lots of responsibility um, or accountability. So really it's about exploring what styles work for you. And, you know, as a, as an effective leader, there's, there's massive opportunities for trial and error. And we've got to consistently enhance or consistently embrace trial and error as part of our learning. If we don't make mistakes, we don't grow and learn. And I'm a big believer in that, that stretch capacity. So stretching your outside your comfort zone. So you're actually making some errors means that you're really um, exploring in the right space. You're being challenged, you're learning, you're growing. You know, and this is my everyday bread and butter. So nailing that basics of that piece, people piece has always been and will continue to be my number one priority. Just wanna share with you a, a really simple model that comes from a, a piece of literature that you may or may not be aware of around Patrick Lencioni's five dysfunctions of a team. And, um, you know, Patrick Lencioni, Patrick Lencioni is, a, is a, an American, um, an American author, he, he wrote Five Dysfunctions of a Team, you know, I think in the mid eighties. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty old book. It's a really simple, short read. And um, you know, I, 
I implore you to explore it if, if you have the opportunity or time. What I, what I recognize as when I explored this book is really high performing teams have really five simple, uh, there's five simple stages. So we're not going to explore all those five stages today, but one of the things that we're going to spend a little bit of time on is digesting that trust piece and in, and in, you know, understanding where that trust piece fits into your influence, your impact and your ability to lead effectively. And recognizing, you know, one of the things I recognized when I read this book is that high performance is not for everyone. It's hard. You know, it genuinely takes a lot of responsibility to take ownership for behaviors and actions that consistently reinforce um, an attitude of non compromising behaviors and mindsets. So it's about daily actions and behaviors for me. And ultimately, you either erode or you enhance trust and high performance standards and values at any particular time in your interactions. So if we look just at trust, you know, integrity for me is at the heart of trust. Really, it's about doing what you're saying you're going to do. And if you look at the simplicity of trust, it's really eroded in two simple ways. Either you make an intentional choice to do something different than what was agreed, or you're just simply doing not what you said you would do. So tr I understand and recognize trust is the foundation for successful leadership. I actually believe that trust is the foundation for successful relationships. And I consistently question and ask myself, you know, how am I becoming highly trusted as a peer or as a leader in this, in this situation? Am I enhancing or eroding my trust in this moment? Is my behavior or are my actions enhancing or eroding my trust? It simply comes, it, it, a lot of it simply comes down to your capability to enhance trust consistently. As procurement leaders, you're consistently building relationships across broad and very complex spectrums of, of stakeholders. You know, so how you can potentially be asking yourself, how are you ensuring those relationships are being enhanced? You know, what are you doing as a trusted advisor, as a trusted colleague? You know, where does respect, integrity, stretch, you know, transparency from the CEO to the janitor in relation to, you know, whoever you're talking to at any particular time, that you have an integrity of interaction across the broad spectrum of people that you deal with on a, on a daily basis. So getting the right people on the boat is the, is the second last concept we're going to explore. So really this is about um, embracing an overarching purpose and ensuring we have the right people in our team. So in, in embracing the overarching purpose is about, will it make the boat go faster? And this comes from a piece, it comes from a book. Um, you know, that I've recently been reading some excerpts from, from Ben Hunt Davis, who was a British Olympian, who, who basically, this, where this concept was born. And this concept was born really uh, it's, a, it's a story from rowing and it's an inspirational story really about a transformation of a team over time from failure to success. It's about trial and error. It's about embracing the courage to change. It's about intentional choices to think and act differently. It's about embracing marginal gain. And when I mean marginal gain, it's about small percentage points gain that influence the overall team performance over time. It's about human sacrifice. It's about how modified behaviors and choices transformed what was a seventh place finishing team in 1998 at the World Championships to a gold, mini, gold uh, medal winning team in 2000, the Sydney Olympics. And that process started with a significant reflection and the courage to reimagine potential. And whether you're a procurement leader or whether you're a sports leader, I, I recognize and acknowledge that uh, often our best opportunities for change occur when we take time to reflect on where we are, where are we headed and where do we imagine ourselves versus our, our current reality versus our potential. It really gives us a, a, a clear idea of what our current reality impact as a leader looks like. So have the courage to do that at times. When I, when I explore this concept of getting the right people on the boat, it's really about role clarity. It's really about every decision relating back to a simple purpose. It's about embracing high level accountability. 
It's about driving standards that lead to performance improvement. Now, I recognize that role clarity is one of the things that uncovers potential more than anything else. When you have people really clear on their roles and their responsibilities, they tend to express their talent really well. Confusion or lack of clarity creates confusion and that immediately detracts from the potential of any team. So procurement leaders who have multi, multi, you know, multi-complex environments to manage, I believe and I am, am absolutely sure that the key, one of the key roles you need to have is to ensure that people around you are absolutely 100% clear on their role, how they help the boat go faster. What does that look like for them? What's their specific responsibility in driving success for themselves and those people around them? So what sort of things do I, do I look at? You know, when I'm looking, when I'm considering this concept of getting the right people on the boat, well, I'll look at complementary skill sets. I'll look at diversity and in and, and leadership capability, people who can connect with people in different ways. I've also got to ensure that I have a, a, a small group of trusted allies and I've got to ensure that the people who are sitting on the boat with me are sitting in the boat in the right place. So I might have my most, most trusted people in key roles. You know, they've got to be de then delivering on those key roles and they've got to, there's got to be direct lines of accountability and action that is going to support that execution of their key roles. I recognise the other thing I've got to do as well as a leader is to ensure that I have the courage to change if it's not working. So I recognise one thing that works for me and I consistently ask myself this question, if a person is unwilling to change over time, and we all have difficult relationships with people who we wish would, would potentially perform differently or, or act differently, can that person change? And if you can't change the man or the woman, change the man or the woman. So have the courage to change and get the right people on the boat. The last concept we're going to explore together is getting a seat at the table and taking people on the procurement journey. So however, however complex or simple your procurement world is, consistently ask yourself a couple of questions. Now, am I creating alignment? Am I creating an understanding of where procurement fits in for my people? Do they recognize where my value add is? So for me, the first step is asking myself, to get a deep understanding, how am I helping my people succeed? What is the level of understanding of significant key factors of procurement and how it affects uh, the coalface, how it affects operations, how it affects different parts of the business? So what is my connection as a procurement leader to the coalface of the business? You know, some environments, there needs to be a change of perspective. We recognise that in relation to how procurement is perceived. So that perception right now is your current reality. So you as procurement leaders need to own that change of perception. So some of that might start with education, might start with connection, might start with creating a shared consciousness of how procurement is adding, adding value. But it might start with, it, it potentially most often starts with critical conversations with key decision makers to enhance where procurement sits in their decision-making process so that you're uh, allowing procurement to be front of mind in the key decisions where procurement needs to be front of mind. So increasing the circle of influence of procurement in any, in any particular discussion. The other thing that I consistently ask myself is, you know, do I understand you know, how the procurement function influences the different layers of success across the business? And for me, it's not about procurement. For me, it's about coaching. It's about how my coaching influences success across my team. It's about removing obstacles, helping individuals succeed. If I help individuals succeed, I know my team's going to grow in capability and, and grow in, and generally have, be more successful. I know it's about building relationships of trust. I also recognize that I've got to have simple processes and functions that allow my teams and allow individuals to drive better outcomes for each other. 
So they've got to be able to support each other. They've got to be able to take ownership for their own development. They've got to take ownership for their own success. And they've got to understand where they fit into the bigger, the bigger puzzle. So when, when I'm considering that, um, you know, I consistently think about my opportunity to contribute. I consistently measure my personal contribution. What does my personal contribution look like? How can my personal contribution be enhanced over time? If I'm an assistant coach, how can I help my head coach be successful? If I'm an assistant coach who looks after one, two or three particular areas of the team or as a procurement leader, looking after potential uh, different areas of the business or different, uh, different projects in the business, how can I help each of the leaders of those projects be successful over time? And 90% of the time, what that boils down to, it boils down to a level of connection and understanding of that person's current reality. What does their current reality look like? What do I need to do as a leader to help them succeed? And how can I help them succeed over time that removes the key obstacles and connects them to the key opportunities that he's going to enable them to help the team succeed underneath them. So they're the key concepts. I'll just, I'll just reinforce those key, those key concepts uh, very quickly for you again. So the key concepts that we spoke about today were, um, you know, it's about procurement as the ultimate team sport. The key concepts we explored was exploring your, sorry, including your best self. So understanding what your best self looks like, developing and executing a plan, getting the basics right, understanding a little bit about high performing teams and developing trust as the key foundation of that high performing teams framework, getting the right people on the boat and ensuring they're sitting in the right seats and you're getting the boat moving faster. If it doesn't make the boat go faster, potentially you need to consider another opportunity or another way. Think differently, act differently, have the courage to think differently and act act differently. And the last concept we explored was getting a seat at the table and how we can potentially influence senior or C-suite leaders' decision-making processes in relation to having procurement at the front of mind. And it's about connection. It's about uh, awareness and, and education around where the value add is. And ultimately, that's about you as a person creating trusted relationships with key decision-makers. So that's our uh, first 30 minutes. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna unshare my screen and I'm gonna pass it over to, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Ashley, who's gonna facilitate the next uh, 15 minutes for us. Hello. Hi Ashley, how are you? Oh God, thank you for all that wisdom. I was literally writing down questions like a mad woman. Uh, throughout all of that and the first question that I wanted to hit you with and I think is very relevant given the times that we are in right now how important is it for us to reflect on our leadership styles our purposes our team vision right now during COVID yeah great place to start um, I'm, a, I'm a massive believer that having clarity genuine clarity on our purpose and our mission is ultimately something that's either going to enable us to, to on the path of effective leadership or potentially allow us to to take lots of detours on the way so the more clear we are in terms of why i get out of bed what i what i stand for as a person and as a leader and then how i connect with those people around me to ensure that they see that in my actions and behaviors every day that is what's going to connect those the, the people that you're influencing every day to the you and who you are. And we know from statistics and, and most recent research, people want to follow good people. It's about the person first. And sure, your technical uh, capabilities will come into that, um, that sort of that overall picture of what an inspirational leader looks like. But ultimately, they want to follow you for who you are. Mm. That's a really, that's a really good answer. And how would you like bring that to your team? 
So right now, as you're going through change, we have to adapt to change. How would you go, okay, this is who we used to be before COVID, and how do we sort of adapt to the change and change our vision and evolve and sort of transform um, ourselves and our teams during a situation like this? Yeah, I love that question. I think transformation, I think transformation is, is at the front of mind for everybody right now. And I think that reflection has been a distinct part of many people's journey uh, during this COVID experience. Um, so I'll just, I'll just share a, a story with you. Um, mm. you know, so for me, it's about at the start of COVID, my wife actually had COVID. Um, so our, our world was tipped upside down. So for me, it was about you know, peeling things back and really recognizing what was important in my life. So that genuinely gives me a clear idea of my purpose. So how do you do that as, as an organization? Well, you've got to go and look at your purpose statement and your mission. And does that reflect the current reality for your business and your challenges? Then you've got to connect the people to that aspiration or vision or purpose, whatever it is. Then if you can connect the people to it and they have a clear understanding of how they're going to influence the successful execution and the successful living on a day-to-day -day basis of the values and standards that represents that mission and purpose, that's when you know you're in a, in a great place. When the language starts to change, when the behaviours start to change, when the connections start to change in your teams and you start listening and observing as a, as a leader from the outside about how your teams are functioning in a more purposeful, connected way, that's when you know you're in a good place as a, as a, as a leader who's driving a purpose-driven organisation. Mm, I love that. And that leads into my next sort of question around change with the culture where you're, your working environment. So how, what advice would you have for us if your team is really adaptable to change, but your culture isn't, they're quite mm. resistant to change. What advice would you have for us? Yeah, change is hard. And change is hard because we don't like it. And so, <laughs> yes. so, so, what, so what, I've, what I've done with a lot of organisations most recently is actually we spend a lot of time in, in the pre-change piece. You know, understanding what are some of the mindsets what are some of the uh, roadblocks? What are some of the potential challenges that are holding us back? Uh, fixed mindsets versus growth mindsets, uh, long-term habits versus short-term habits, um, you know, ease, e ease and functionality versus stretch and potentially um, better outcomes. So where people will always sit in different places on the spectrum in relation to their uh, readiness for change. So what we've got to do, we've got to shift people down the spectrum in terms of their readiness for change. So you've got to get them connected to the why. Once you get them connected to the why, they understand then how they fit into that change over time. Then you can make it about them. And you really depowering and depressurizing the change environment by making it about learning skills that we just haven't learned yet. It's not about our inability to have uh, capability in this space or this space. We're just, we're just transforming or evolving over time. And we're learning new skills and growing capability. So it depressurizes that whole change element and makes it more positive, shifts it to a growth mindset challenge versus a gap analysis challenge where we're filling, we're filling this gap because we just don't have it. Um, and people then get on board because they recognize that they're growing and developing as well as individuals over time, which, which directly then enhances the capability of your teams around you. So individual, so really it's about purpose, unpacking the change bit first, and then individualize, individually connecting that, those people to that purpose and execution of it. Mm, good answer. A question came through from Andy, and they, um, the question is, they say you learn more from your failures than your successes. What's one of your sports coaching failures and what did you learn from it? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, I, can't <laughs> share all of, I can't share all of my failures because we don't have enough time. Um, but I think as, as, you gain, as you gain experience, what you, what you learn is you, you fail more and you have, you have more courage to fail. And failure, failure becomes part of, and you sort of repackage failure up 
you don't, you know, failure, you don't sort of package it up as something negative. I package up failure now as a learning opportunity. So every mistake I make is a learning opportunity. So then how I package that failure up into a maximized learning opportunity will mean that I learn myself, people around me will learn, the people that need to learn from that opportunity learn, and then they connect to those, they connect with the people who potentially might peripherally be affected by that failure and who need to learn as well. So it's about reshaping that failure into an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to enhance my team by taking that learning on board and not missing any, any failed moments as learning opportunities. Mm, that was a good question. I like that. No such thing as failure. It's all learning lessons here. Absolutely. That's my, that's my belief. One of the, um, the, uh, another question that I had was around getting a seat at the table. So can you um, give us any sort of stories or some experiences around that, how you start getting yourself at the table, especially when people might not know what procurement's role is and why we should be at the table. Can you share yeah. some insight around that? Absolutely. I think the most important conversation you have when you get into any environment in any um, role is a critical conversation with your uh, direct report about how are you going to be how are you are going to be measured, and what that looks like. And I genuinely think that a lot of people do not have that clarity in relation to how they're measured by the outside. They may have some concepts and ideas from their job description about how they're going to be measured. So they go away delivering, um, you know. You know, almost beehive like, like in terms of droning through their work and ticking boxes to get their work done. But ultimately what's happening in the background is that the perception of the people above them is, is quite different. So they actually think that they should be measured or procurement should be, should be measured in a, in, a, in a different way. So I implore you to have consistent, meaningful conversations with your direct reports about how you're being measured and also how that is changing and evolving over time. Because you having real clarity on that will give you genuine, will give you a genuine opportunity to have clarity in your own planning and your own priorities. So understand how you understand how you're going to be measured and then know your priorities from that. Mm, I like that. Another that question I had, which, Oh, sorry. sorry actually. And that was one of the key lessons I took from, from, um, from rugby in the past is that the more clear that conversation I had at the start of any engagement, the clearer my path was in terms of creating a plan that would, that would work and I could execute for success. Mm. That, that leads right into my next question around sort of stakeholder alignment, because I guess, Sometimes procurement can be super process focused or super compliant focused and not necessarily getting our audience or stakeholders buying into that. So what would your advice be? Because sometimes we have to be bad cop and we have to be the ones with like, you know, the stick saying, no, you can't do that. How would you help align our sort of stakeholders that are not used to procurement or don't really yep. understand our sort of compliance and processes? Yeah, and this is one of the things I, I learned with my connected conversation with, with procurement professionals uh, leading into this as part of my research. And one of the things that I learned is that um, for a couple of those procurement professionals, they share with me the key role for them was connecting with their people at the coalface. You know, really understanding how procurement decisions affected them in relation to their role. And whether it created obstacles or whether it removed obstacles. So really the message is, you know, start from an empathetic place, you know, walk some steps in the people's shoes that you're influencing with your key decision making and potentially go and spend some time on the coalface with those people and watch how they work, understand what they need, have conversations, critical conversations with the people that you're most clearly affecting and then they will engage with you in a very different way because A, they know you care, B, they know you understand, and C, they know that you're trying to make the best decision 
with all the information you have in front of you that's going to have the team and their op and the team and whatever their success looks like at front of mind. If that can be a clear uh, decision making um, sort of a cue when you're making your decisions, is is this decision the best thing for that team? Then you know, as a leader, whether you're a procurement leader or whether you're a leader in any other business, you know that that's a really good place for you to make that decision from. Mm. We had um, a question come through, someone who's anonymous, and it says, what would your advice be on the balance of sticking to the plan and goals and showing agility to move depending on the circumstance, i.e., when do you change? Great. And I'm, I, I don't have the expertise to tell you when to change as a procurement leader, but what you recognise as an expert decision maker is you recognise cues or... Um, or potential opportunities that you've seen in the past through experience, you recognize that they might be red flags or you recognize critical opportunities. So you recognize small things in relation to your plan that either are taking you away from the plan that is, is uh, currently in place and it, it allows you to be ag agile and adapt and potentially take a slightly different path because you know if you take that slightly different path, you're actually maximizing that current that opportunity that has arised through any particular tangible change. And we recognize right now that change is the new normal. And change happens all around us. So we can only we can only accept and adapt to change if we are willing to accept it. Okay, this change has happened. It's often when we often make really poor decisions around um, around rigid planning because we've we've identified the plan we think it's a perfect plan and we don't want to we don't want to adapt and adjust from it well rigid planning means that you do not identify key opportunities to make that plan better so for me it's about yes having the structure and a clear plan in place but you've got to recognize those small tangents or detours that you need to go off onto to maximize the impact of the plan over time because when you made the plan versus when you're implementing the plan is generally a very different time. So recognizing the current reality has different mm -hmm. current reality pressures, different current reality opportunities or threats that you as a leader need to be courageous enough to respond to. And then and to align to your, Ooh. yeah. And sorry. then, sorry. sorry. <laughs> sorry. And then, then you need to align your people to that decision-making process so they can understand the why. If I understand the why, they'll be connected. They'll, they'll then be connected with you on that journey. I was going to say, add to, adding to that, another question came through that fits in with that, and it says, um, "It's from anonymous again. Have you ever had to manage up with a leader resistant to change?" So absolutely, many times, and it's about courageous conversations. Mm -hmm. It's about taking yourself outside the comfort zone. And my, I always ask myself this question. If I take this issue, this challenge or this opportunity to the head coach or to the CEO, I do a lot of work in professional services in New Zealand or to the senior partner, will it create an opportunity to enhance the team? That's the question I ask myself. If my answer is yes, I absolutely take that question to that person or that challenge. If the answer is no, or it's potentially not the right time to take that, um, that opportunity or threat or question to that leader, I choose another opportunity. But I simply ask myself, is it going to serve the team? And if it's going to serve the team, bang, I make that decision and I, and I create the opportunity to try to influence that next layer of leadership. I like that. Um, another question came through from Greg. What importance do you place celebrating successes, big or small, along the way to achieving your ultimate goal? Thanks, Greg. Hugely important. Celebrating success, I think, is in my current view of the corporate space, is the thing that underwhelms me the most. Um, I'll give you a story. Last, I was last month working with a senior manager, senior leadership group that during COVID had had 10% growth in their business. And they they had taken um, you know they'd made significant gains they had lost no staff 
Um, so their performance has been outstanding. For the first 30 minutes of their month of their monthly check-in meeting, it was nothing but negative. So they didn't spend any time on, on celebrating success. So I, I'm a big believer in two things. Recognize success, celebrate it, get it celebrated from the inside. So it's, it's team members rewarding team members. Then you have lots of conversations about success happening all the time. Open up your eye, change your eye from looking for things to fix to looking for things that are good. Then you can have conversations about success all the time. Oh, I really love the way that you dealt with that person. Yesterday I was walking past in the corridor. Mm -hmm. I really love your language and I love the outcomes of that conversation. Great job, well done, fantastic. Or dealing with, it, dealing with a stakeholder. I love the fact that you've pivoted to find us a different solution in, in that space. You know, that's really, that's really gonna make a difference to our, um, to, our customer, to our customer service bottom line. Thank you very much for bringing that solution to us. So celebrate success all the time. That can be a part of your mindset, a part of your mm -hmm. psyche of looking for the good. It actually changes the psyche in your environment. Rituals are one of the best things you can do. So creating little rituals each month, uh, employee of the month. We used to have a spear. Uh, when I coached the Tongan rugby team, we had a spear that we handed over every, every team, every week, sorry, that represented the, the person that made the best contribution to their performance week. So it wasn't just about the game, it was about the whole week. It was about contribution. So that was one of the ways we uh, reinforce um, celebrating success, rituals. Look for the good, please. Mm. Another question that came from uh, Dion, apologies if I said your name wrong. How do you drive uh, continuous improvement in your leadership skills? Is there any books or podcasts that you recommend? Yeah, there's lots of good, I, I, I love some rugby podcasts. Uh, there's some really good stuff out there at the moment. Um, you know, the Harvard Business School is a really good one. Eddie Jones has got a great podcast that I listen to a lot. And his is a lot about, um, it's about different ways of learning. Challenge yourself, challenge yourself to do, you know, have different ways of learning. Just remind me of the, the, the key of the question again, Ashley, sorry. Um, to improve your leadership skills, which books or podcasts? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, if you look up leadership on, on the internet, unfortunately, there's a myriad of op options. What I, what I love about Eddie Jones's message is that he compartmentalizes things into, okay, so what are the key skills? I'm not going to try and develop leadership as a whole. I'm going to try and develop key skills that, that are going to enhance my leadership over time. So, I might, I might just consider looking at my questioning. I might just consider looking at my uh, purpose-driven leadership. I might just look at um, exploring my adaptability in difficult situations. I might just look at my critical conversations. So whatever the key challenges that you have, and it's got specific and key context for you as well, make sure that you've got a narrow focus in terms of what you're trying to work on instead of trying to work on something broad. So narrow the focus, give yourself some, some times and some outcomes, and then just explore what's out there because there's, plenty, there's some plenty, plenty of great stuff out there. I love some simple books like um, The Fred Factor, um, you know, um, that Patrick Lencioni book, Five, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Team of Teams by Stanley McChrystal. So there are a couple of things that I read or have read Perfect. recently. Love it. Well, I will wrap it up there because I'm sure that you and I could talk all day about all this stuff. So I'm going to hand us over to Sharon for closing comments. Thank you so much, Grant. Thanks, Tivoli. I just hope everyone's taken at least one thing out of, the, uh, of today's session that they can go and explore in their own time. It's about having the courage to transfer some of these learnings to their own environment. Good luck with everything. Great. That was fantastic, Grant. I, I love the way that you talked about connections and collaboration and trust. Uh, that is the most important, as well as that whole part around um, purpose-led leadership, value-led leadership. Great stuff. Thank you so much. Good job. And thanks also to Ashley. Um, if you loved that, there's more to come. In fact, we've got the whole Best in Procurement series continuing. So um, that's the best of the best the winners of the awards so the next one up is on the 13th of October and that's supplier diversity so join us to hear from the winners the South Australian Department for Child Protection as they share 
their winning project, partnering with Aboriginal business. So that's the 13th of October, midday and 2 p.m. in New Zealand. Um, 15th of October, another one, procurement transformation. And this time we'll hear from the winners of Watercare in New Zealand as they share their winning project, the enterprise model. So for all those details and more, please go to our SIPS website or stay tuned on our LinkedIn page. Um, before you leave today, now this is really important. I want you to take a few minutes to fill out our post events webinar survey because we really need your feedback to make it even better next time. So please just take a few minutes to fill that out. And we'd like you all to encourage, continue up the good work that you're doing around social distancing. Um, we are making a difference to tackle this coronavirus outbreak. So stay safe and be well, everyone. See you next time.